So let me start off by first, um, in a sense, uh, broadening the discussion from beyond RTI and the freedom of the media, which we celebrate today, frame the discussion in a little bit of a different way um, and bring in more of the reasons why right to information has become so powerful in our region and no, globally. My, my speaker, uh, can you hear me? It's muted. Yeah. Is it muted? Can you hear? Go ahead, please. Yes. Go ahead. Um, yes. So, uh, first of all, I think we should acknowledge very fairly, basically, that across the world, democracy and the right and the rule of law is on the retreat. Um, in our country, in Sri Lanka, and in other countries, I think it, be, it would be very much uh, opportune to say that all the essentials of a democratic order, of a constitutional order that we have been held to observe as sacrosanct, an independent judiciary, um, uh, uh, free but responsible media, and the constitutional separation of powers, that these are actually uh, being rendered nugatory in the current process and the current uh, uh, climate in which our country is operating. Now, in other words, we are invited to actually um, think or believe that these norms are not essential for a functioning of a society and for society to be prosperous and to be democratic. And to my mind, there is a very problematic development that we see around in the world in Sri Lanka as well. Now, perhaps we may ask why that is so. And I think, and I would argue really, that this is due to a very great failure of the legal governance. Uh, in Sri Lanka, as in other countries, we have a situation where um, basically uh, there's a major disconnect really between the constitution and what the law promises for citizens and what it actually delivers. So in conceptualizing RTI, actually reimagining re RTI for Sri Lanka, our basic tool and our basic objective was to look at RTI as empowering the citizen as empowering the citizen. That was the primary purpose of right to information, which we argued, advocated, and struggled for in Sri Lanka for 14 years. Those who are familiar with the process and who are participating in this may know that from 2003 onwards, that though we had a right to information bill before parliament, it was never passed because of political conversions. And the process went on and on and on. And ultimately in 2016, uh, the right to information act in Sri Lanka was passed. Now, actually, what is great and what is wonderful is that despite the enactment of the law and the process before that, uh, not being broad-based, unlike in India, as Mr. Singha and Professor Sridhar and every people who join in would know, in India, it was mass-based. It was in Rajasthan, it was in Tamil Nadu, it was you know, in, in states, and then it came to Delhi. In Sri Lanka, that was not the case. So we had uh, activists, we had lawyers, we had editors, journalists, agitating and advocating for the information law, and it was passed finally in parliament unanimously in 2016. But what is really, really, I would say is a gain is that since the law was enacted, it is the ordinary persons, ordinary citizens of Sri Lanka who have used the law far more than the media, far more than even civil society uh, across, across the country. So that I think sitting on the commission, it is, it is very uh, inspiring to see ordinary persons, ordinary villagers coming to the commission, standing up to state power and saying, no, we want something to be done about the injustice caused to us. We want something done about the injustice caused to us. So, so to my mind, RTI is about injustice. It's about empowering citizens to speak out against injustice. And if you look at the past four years, we are a child, we are an infant compared to India and to other countries in the region and in the, in the world. But if you look at the past four years, you would see the way in which people have just used the law to get everything that is that to rectify everything that is wrong in their communities. So from villagers in the South who have used the law to have their children admitted to schools, to rectify problems in their communities from garbage disposals to you know, many, many other things. To uh, Northern mothers who have uh, agitated in the, in the middle of the global pandemic last year, who have agitated, used RTI to improve facilities in their hospitals and got those facilities really from the divisional district secretaries. 
Um, so you can see the pattern across the country from the north to the south of people using RTI. And that is a really unifying thread um, that we can, we can see across the country for the last four years. Now that I think is a, is a great, great, uh, wonderful, uh, you know, uh, experiment, a great, wonderful development really as it were. Um, and if you actually see the way communities have realized that what binds them is more the disempowerment, is more a unifying common thread of disempowerment rather than ethnic, race or religious differences. Um, and they have got together in the commonality of their struggle across the country. Um, Mr. Singha, you spoke about uh, villagers in India, you know, using RTI for welfare benefits to get things that may seem small to us or to anybody else, but which are really fundamental to their lives. In Sri Lanka, we have seen that happening in very, very uh, obvious ways. Um, so, for example, the 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 RTI to actually go beyond the mere information asking and a mere information release and to actually empower citizens to stand up against the state, to ask questions from the state. I mean, this is the country that has suffered civil and ethnic conflict in the north and in the south for more than 40, 50 years. So even to ask questions from a police officer is a problematic thing. It is not something that many villagers take lightly, but RTI empowered them to do that. So what was a very fantastic thing, and I think that uh, I've talked about this earlier as well, um, is that on the very first day that right to information law was enacted in Colombo in parliament, um, you know, you had uh, 15 northern mothers going to a police station in the east of the country in Batakalo and asking police uh, officers who are predominantly Sinhalese, majority Sinhalese police officers, asking them what has happened to our children who disappeared during the conflict. And they had taken copies of the Tamil Act with them to this police station. And the Sinhalese police officers who were very young from the South. They did, not, they did not understand Tamil, they could not read Tamil. So then they were very, very aghast and they said, oh, you know, what is this law? We don't know about this. And the mothers had to explain to these police officers, the young boys from the South, what the RTI law was all about, the Sinhalese they knew. They, you, they spoke in Sinhalese to the Sinhalese uh, police officers and said, this is the law, this is the law and it empowers us. And I think uh, that is something that we could not have seen before 2016, that empowering of ordinary citizens. Um, and the stories are many. I mean, you can, hundreds and hundreds of stories across, across the north to the south. Now, uh, basically those are not the stories that actually grip the headlines in Colombo. They are not the stories that go to the media. Those are the big high profile stories. So you have the, stories of, for example, the uh, president's orders being uh, exposed in terms of banning a news website, which came up through RTI. You have the uh, story of the uh, procurement report, which uh, looked into irregularities of the previous government being released through RTI. You have the RTI application in regard to the prime minister, prime minister's declaration of assets, the previous prime minister's declaration of assets. Most recently, uh, uh, disclosure order to release the lists of all parliamentarians who have declared their assets. So these are the stories that occupy the headlines. Uh, also a commission report that had disappeared was released uh, and found through RTI. But to my mind, what is really more powerful are the ordinary stories of ordinary people who have activated the law and made the law real to their lives. And actually in that sense, spoken truth to power and made an impact on the political class, whichever government is in power. In Sri Lanka, whichever government comes to power, we have always had a failure of accountability, general accountability in terms of uh, how rulers rule people and govern people, we have had a failure of that accountability. And this was a weapon and a tool that ordinary people used to demand accountability from uh, the officials who were in their, in their regions and in the areas. So basically, I think that, uh, you know, if you look at the operation of the RTI Act, it's also a very great thing that women have used it so much uh, in the North and in the South. Um, and there is again this story that I will always, uh, you know, it's difficult for me to forget that story because this particular, this one woman who was, um, who was living in the East in Ampara, um, she had used uh, the RTI uh, uh, law to, uh, ask for information from a public officer 
about the buildings was cell, cell phone wire, cell phone, cell phone tower on her land. So what had happened here was that uh, the local authority had given permission for the cell phone, cell phone tower to be erected on her land with the connivance and the permission of this lady's nephew, member of the family. But the permission was given ir irregularly because she did not give her permission. She was the owner of the land. So she put an RTI request to the local authority saying, who gave you permission to erect this tower on my land? I'm the owner, not my nephew. And the lo local authority was so astounded by this that they withdrew the plan to build on her land and they scrapped it. Now, this one powerful statement she made, she said in one stroke, um, I challenged the patriarchy in my family, I challenged the state, and I challenged the corporate stru uh, structure. So you can see the way that even in the film, you can see the way that it is predominantly the women who have come out and agitated. Tamil women, single women, women uh, Muslim women have come out and agitated really for the betterment of their community. And of course, as Mrs. Singh has said, in Sri Lanka also you get frivolous applications. You get frivolous, uh, you know, uh, appellants, litigants who try and embarrass public officials. In the Art Chair Commission, we have many applications like that. And many of those are also grievance, uh, grievance, uh, you know, uh, sort of complaints. Something, something wrong has been done to me in, in the office, or my promotion has been denied to me, and that's wrong. Um, so I think basically what we should look at is that this is also a rights issue because a grievance uh, done to a human being, whether in the matter of, of employment or in any other context, is also a wrong. Is also something that you can use RTI for. But I do agree that the need to guard against vexatious uh, use of the RTI Act is important. Uh, we are seeing that very much uh, in, in, uh, in Sri Lanka at the moment, where we do have people filing multiple applications uh, you know, against the same public authority, and that is a problem. And I think we should look at perhaps practical ways in which we can get around that. Um, but really, if you look at the broad way in which RTI has worked in Sri Lanka for the last four years, it has been immensely encouraging immensely positive. And I do think that going on, that this would be something that we should preserve and keep really for the future. Now about challenges. Um, so the first issue is about the global pandemic. And I think last year when Sri Lanka was hit by the epidemic uh, like in uh, like India, the effect of it was not that bad because we did have problems about meeting. We did have problems about, um, you know, sort of discussing, uh, you know, certain issues and certain cases, but uh, Despite all those problems, we were able to get through this. We were able to have digital hearings. We used certain uh, high technology uh, avenues to try and overcome that problem. Uh, currently, with the third wave hitting Sri Lanka, it has been far more difficult. We have had problems with what do you do in offices of quarantine? What do you do when public uh, officials say that they, you know, they, they have had no time to go into matters and uh, apprise the commission of what uh, particular status of a complaint is? So that's been an issue. We should really regionally strategize around how we can get through this and how we can overcome this. Um, secondly, I think the issue of, of resources, maybe not an issue in India, but in Sri Lanka, it is very much an issue. Um, I think the one weakness in the Sri Lankan Act has been the failure to provide adequate independent resources to the RTI Commission. Uh, the Act says that we get our resources, our funding through Parliament. What this practical means is that the nodal agency under the Act, the Minister of Media, funnels and charts the money uh, through the ministry to the commission. And that is a big problem. But there is also theoretical conflict of interest uh, because the Minister of Media, for example, any ministry would be a public authority under the act and would be in fact subject to the oversight of the RTI commission. So having that uh, funding channel through the nodal agency to the commission, I think is a problem. And practically we have been having major issues with our funding since uh, you know the time that we were established and we function when we started functioning. Um, and the third issue is to my mind, I think, um, as was said earlier as well, the path forward for RTI should be proactive disclosure. It is very well and good to have, uh, you know, a powerful law, to have an independent commission, to have, uh, you know, all the devices that one would use against a hostile state. For example, in Sri Lanka, the law was devised envisaging a hostile state. And that is why probably the law has worked for the past four years because each and every loophole which a state officer could use was plugged in the law. But in the long run, uh, you know, 
you need to really work through persuasion. You need to work through proactive disclosure. You need to work through voluntary disclosure by the state. And that I think is quite weak in South Asia, in India, in Sri Lanka, in Nepal, so on and so forth. And that again ought to be regional strategized uh, to see how we can overcome that really, because ultimately the good working of government is a positive thing for the government. That should be the first and, and uh, predominant principle on which the government should really look at RTI, not as something that can be used against the government really. Um, finally, and I would just conclude because my stat the statistics and so on and so forth about the RTI Commission will be addressed, I think, by a lady in a later presentation. But finally, I would like to say that the biggest challenge in my mind going forward is that how do you preserve the independence of the Right to Information Commission? Now, the law was looked at in a way that the major feature was to set up an independent oversight agency that is not appointed or does not operate through executive fiat, does not operate through executive will or pleasure. So the members were appointed not solely through the political appointment, through the, the president's uh, or the executive will, but through a nomination process. So you had uh, civil society organizations making the nominations, you had the media, and you had the bar association, the lawyers. And it was it were the nominees from those organizations that were ultimately vetted and then went to uh, the president who then made the appointments. So there was a, in a sense a check on the balance of power by the executive on the making appointments to the commission. Um, and of course, as many of you may know, in Sri Lanka, we had the 20th amendment last year, which uh, basically vested all powers in the presidency. So going forward, how would then this impact on the Right to Information Commission when, our, when the terms of the current commissioners expire in September of 2021? And I think it's very important because in, in, the, in the Sri Lankan law, the commission has huge powers. Um, the commission has the power of uh, prosecution, prosecuting public officers when they don't obey the commission's directives. And that's a very powerful threat really to hold out to uh, ensure compliance by public authorities. It has the power to determine which cases, uh, in which cases information ought to be released from the public or public interest override. Unlike in India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, Sri Lanka does not have agencies exempt from the RTI law. We only have the national security exemption operating across uh, as a general exemption, but we won't exempt entities from the reach of the RTI law. Um, and in all cases, including in national security, the public interest can operate over and above to release the information. And it is the commission that decides all this. It's a commission that delineates or defines the boundaries of what is the public interest, gives guidance to the public authorities on when they should uh, use their discretion to release the information. We don't have a, a commission that is an oversight body that is independent and acts strongly, then the, the, the possibility of the RTI law becoming uh, practically nugatory. Is, uh, is, very much, uh, is very much alive. Um, but these are all concerns for the future and let's look at things positively. As far as Sri Lanka is concerned, the law itself has been, I think, justified more than enough the expectations of the people when it was enacted in 2016. So I think we should look forward to what we can do uh, very positively, positively in the future moving forward. Thank you.